John's opened up a lot of different stuff that you guys know about and some stuff in the past as well that's done some really rad stuff. Probably recently, Handsome Biscuit, Field Guide, and Toast. Um, and today he's going to talk a little bit about the adventure and John, take it away. Cash flow, right? Cash flow. Is that my Yes. Cool. All right. So. Startups, right? What? Uh, how many people in here have have uh, started a business already? So most folks are. How about looking to start a business? Cool. So now, how many people in here are CPAs? I'm talking about cash flow, so I want to make sure I don't uh, <laughs> back myself in any corners. Uh, I'm almost there. Okay, good, good. Well, maybe you can help me out as I stumble my way through the. Uh, the technical parts, but um, so I've started quite a few businesses, uh, most successful, some successful for a while, and then not so successful, some super capital intensive, some not so capital intensive. So kind of a, a broad range of experiences. Um, I think what I didn't realize when I was starting out was there are very different at the high level, very different types of accounting. There and the there are multiples of the two, I guess, to, to, to talk about today are financial accounting and managerial accounting. And that's sort of what I really didn't get at the beginning. It makes sense, sort of the, the, the elements of each, but financial accounting is really uh, can be thought of uh, a lot or even larger, maybe publicly held uh, businesses. So it's a, it's a way of conforming to a, a set of standards that is it required for reporting? It's really not applicable in the startup world. Now you have to, to do a lot of those things in general, specifically even to, to do sort of uh, tax accounting to so your, your end of the year or whatever you have to do with the IRS. But moving beyond that, there's this whole uh, train of thought called managerial accounting. And managerial accounting is accounting that's generally intended from, from building data to sort of an, harvesting it and then analyzing it. It's, it's it is intended to help uh, owners and operators make decisions. There's a huge difference. There's a really big difference. Um, one of the main ones is that managerial accounting becomes much more detailed, but it's also things that maybe uh, historically you may not want known outside of your company. Um, so I guess that's the first big distinction. So as you're sort of jumping down this path and whatever your industry may be, there's probably some literature out there on managerial accounting for I don't know farming or whatever whatever you're whatever you're doing. So I would I would look into that. Um, so beyond that, we we what Zach has sort of talked to me about speaking about is cash flow. And uh, I think with cash flow, with for me, what was the the easiest thing to conceptualize is the bank account. So that's a that's a great place to sort of see or at least think that you see cash flow. Um, I don't know the exact definition, sort of technical definition of cash flow, but it generally is the flow in and out of your, your business of cash itself. And it comes from three places, really two, which will be applicable for startups, which are um, operations, which is, you know, as you begin to farm, you bring in cash. So cash comes into your bank account. And the other is financing. So uh, in order to buy your tractor, you took in cash, you had ca in incoming cash flow, that um, help to finance the start of your business or maybe expansion or maybe operations if you're not so lucky at the moment. So those are the two sort of places that come from and, they, and, and you should treat them very differently, at least from a mental perspective. You may compartmentalize them within an accounting system or even have a separate bank account, but um, they should be thought about in very different ways. So starting with um, cash flow from financing, you really, uh, this is an area where you can think about this as a, as a tool for what you want to do with your company. Maybe you're starting it, maybe you're growing it. Uh, it's obviously a, a uh, piece, I guess the reason or my reason for thinking very differently about it is because it's very finite. So, so and, and to some degree, so is your, your operations cash flow, but it's very finite. So you take in cash because you've, let's say, borrowed it or you've lent it to the company yourself, 
um, but the company has borrowed it some way and financed it. So that you have that nest egg there that you need to do something with, but confusing it with the operations cash flow is deadly. It's, it is a, a fast way to watch your bank account go down close to zero and then all of a sudden plummet. And you don't really know why. And really, you, you were looking the entire time at cash flow that, that had come in from financing when and it wasn't giving you a good take on sort of the way you're, the, the health of your, your company, the managerial sort of side of the accountant. So that sort of, I guess, brings me to my, um, one of my sort of pet peeves, one of my red flags, I guess, is if a company is operating from a financial sort of accounting and decision-making perspective, by looking at the bank account, you're in big trouble. Now, as you're starting up, that may likely be the case that you're looking at your bank account to say, hey, can this, well, is this check going to clear? Kind of, you know, gives you a, a comfort feeling to some degree. But the red flag comes because uh, you likely have significant liabilities, obviously, depending on your particular industry or company or, or business model, you likely have significant liabilities that are sitting out there. So the cash that's in your bank account is not really representative of, of, what uh, you have to sort of be spending, or maybe you have a, if you're looking at a burn rate, how many months you have to sort of survive before you become profitable. So managing a company based on logging into the bank account is very dangerous. Um, who has questions so far? Or thoughts? Who's had trouble with cash flow? That's a great question. So even when you start, <laughs> Um, and you, I mean, I know we want to start thinking about cash flow early on, but what do you do when you're starting from basically nothing? Because I, I mean, a lot of us are, um, when we jump out there, um, I know my first two times trying to start uh, a company, I didn't really have anything. And then the third time I tried to start a company, I had something, but I, I think I was still operating like I had nothing and just ran out of everything that I had. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the people that are, I think are generally starting now, you know, it's just a dream they have and they don't really have any, any capital up front. So what do, what do they do with that? Yeah, case? I think those are some, some great points. So the one thing you can always have is a budget. And if your, your budget, you can create a budget. So if your budget is zero dollars, it's going to be challenging to have much financial management in general. So let's, the, the, sake of sort of conversation, let's assume you have some budget, maybe it's $100, maybe it's $1,000, maybe it's as much money as you can make from your other job in the next six months, you know, so, something like that. And you can sort of estimate those inflows of cash, which would be a financing source. So um, I think the budget is really where I would, where I would go to for somebody looking to start up. It, I, I would say, do not get hung up on the budget being perfect. Start with a budget, get any budget down. It's, it's, I, I definitely used to get hung up on, well, you know, let me, make, I want to make sure I want to get so granular in the detail that I'm, I'm looking for every source of you know, cost that could come through and trying to account for all of that. If you can do that, great, but don't get hung up on it. Get, create a budget and then sort of work from there. A budget can be sort of a living document. You can continue to update it and modify it as things become um, more real or more concrete, or you change your idea, you pivot to something else, whatever the case may be. Um, so I would say in general, if you're starting from what feels like nothing, create something, which is a budget. Um, the, another thing that you, you sort of mentioned in the, in the advent of, of your experience starting businesses is the, the idea, I guess, of, of uh, acting like you're poor even when you're not. And from a cash flow standpoint, I think that's important. Because you, you and I have gotten lured into in the past thinking, hey, you know, this we're, we're, we're making good money. I'm watching the bank accounts increase or the accounts in QuickBooks increase. And it seems like maybe it's a good time to um, make some other investments or sort of um, take some responsibilities or some duties off of my shoulders by either outsourcing or hiring in. And it's... I would encourage you to, as, as you may be a very, you're probably not a very conservative person if you're starting a business, but um, I would encourage you to really try and pretend you're poor for as long as possible. It's going to help you down the road. Uh, it, is everybody uh, familiar with the term of like a burn rate of cash? Is anybody not? Or maybe I'll, so, so a burn rate is sort of, um, I guess it's in general is a, uh, 
an amount of money that you need to survive on a periodic basis, let's say a month, um, without any cash flow coming in or, or with, let's say, your operations not sort of maybe not being profitable. There's sort of different realms that people can um, operate under. But so it's it's if I if I've just started my company, my farming company, and I need to plant my fields and wait for it to grow and fertilize and whatever I do. And I'm, I'm planning on being able to harvest and sell my product in six months. Well, then I need to at least have a six month sort of burn rate of cash. Like each month I still have to pay for this equipment. I still have to pay for this bar and I still have to, what, what I still have to pay maybe for my living expenses. If that's what I'm doing. Um, if that's what I'm using some of this cash for. So, that, that would be a burn rate. Kind of thinking about that and establishing as, as much as possible, I think is also a great tool to, to think about, depending on, again, your industry. Some people who, who has an idea or has started a business that is profitable or, or the operations are generating profit from day one. Interesting. I, 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 it, that's more my experience, um, but, it, but there are a lot of people who you know look, look at uh, investment to leverage sort of future um, profitability and um, it's really important then that you establish a burn rate because obviously at the, the day you open you're headed to closing if, I mean you're, you're gonna burn the cash that you have eventually assumedly you don't have an infinite supply or a huge supply of cash you're gonna burn that you're headed towards your closing so understanding those parameters and looking at the bank account and saying great I've got fifty thousand dollars but I know my burn rate is ten thousand dollars a month I've got about five months to live so it's, it's pretty, pretty simple math, but it's, um, I think, critical to be aware of. Uh, so how do you figure out what that budget is? Do you figure out what your expenses are going to be and that's it? Or do you say, I have $10,000 that I can put towards this? How do you determine what, like, how much cash you have to give towards something? Or is it the opposite? So I, what I would say if, uh, would be, that you establish an operations budget and maybe it should be more more specific so uh, as you operate what will be the cash coming in if any and what will the, the expenses going out so income and outgoing again cash flow using a budget from cash flow perspective and saying uh, i i intend to at least that's my hope or i intend to maybe not aspirational but sort of what, whatever you think you're the real real world most likely scenario is I think I'm going to have this much money coming in and I think I'm going to have this much going out and sort of using that as a budget. Uh, and then, you know, reviewing it somewhat, you know, again, periodically, maybe monthly and saying, was this realistic? Has my burn rate changed? Are we bringing in more money or less money or do we have higher expenses or lower expenses? Um, yes. Hey, I will also like to comment that in business, uh, most entrepreneurs do not also consider their personal budget when it comes to coming up with the operations budget. Because a lot of people who start business, they they feed themselves off the revenue that comes in the business. And you have to be realistic and say, okay, the business has this type of, has these many types of expenses, and I have to make sure that my breaking point is this. But also personally, I have to maintain my, my standard of living at this particular rate. So, when you come up with those budgets, especially the burn rate, you have to also consider the personal side too. And, and I like to just add that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think uh, so entrepreneurs, myself included, are, are, are frequently really excited to sort of quit their day job. Uh, and the longer you can wait to not do that, if you have a day job, the better. I mean, you, you, you will be, there's, there's all sorts of rationalizations you can come up with. Hey, if I was working on this all full time, I could really be pushing it forward. And, and there may be large portions that are, that are true. But if your personal finances sink the business faster than the operations do, it's a bigger problem. You know? So I think keeping your day job, if you have one, or whatever your source of income is, your sugar daddy, I don't know. Uh, I think it, that, that's important to keep in perspective and not sort of talk yourself out of it. It should be really painful. It should be like I'm, I'm up all hours of the night. I, I have basically two full time jobs at this point and I cannot physically do it. And we also have revenue coming in. So now I can quit my job. If you have two full time jobs and you're spending 80, 90, 100 hours a week, one is paying you like your normal job and the other one is not bringing in it in any cash. There's a problem, right? 
you're, you're putting in, is one thing if you're in sort of R&D or, or, or setup phase, but if you're starting to operate your business even and you've got this sort of dichotomy, I think there, it, it, it's, it's, there's potential that there may be a huge problem. You know, you're, you're looking at something that you're spending a ton of time on and not able to uh, see some cash flow from. Maybe it's part of the plan, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a hard world to live in. What other questions or thoughts? Yes. On that last point about um, you know, your personal income, uh, when I first started, uh, I would basically just take whatever was left over from the business. And then as I got a little more serious, I established in my company budget how much I would take out every month. And so uh, in the company budget, I had a line item which was you know, my income. Yeah. And, and that was it. And I stuck to that. And I had to make sure that I made you know, enough support the business and myself yeah that's a great great point a lot of companies use it as sort of a uh, a backwards looking budgeting so they look and they look and they they include a percentage of profit whatever their intended profit is and work backwards through um and and, and create a budget that way so basically building in your the profit from the beginning from a budgeting standpoint I have a question what are some of the ways when you start small or unique or whatever it is, a lot of times the stuff that you guys have done, you've started one or two days a week. Um, is that you guys trying to ramp up the cash flow so you can stay open longer? Like, what is that? What's the mentality behind that that slow curve? So it does a few things. Um, it does do things like being able to take uh, cash from sales and go buy food for the next day. Um, it also creates a system where you can have less mistakes or theoretically less mistakes. Uh, you're, you're the, the more you're open or the more you are operating, the more heavily intense that is, whatever, whatever you're doing from the beginning, be, there's always going to be, there's always going to be bumps in the road. And so those bumps, the more you're open, the harder they're going to be to absorb correct or to make less, um, to have less effect on your business down the road. So there's, there's a little bit of that perspective too. Does that make sense? Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, I think I would, I would add to it. There is an element of everything that, that I have done, at least in recent years, where we try to be, we try to figure out a scenario that is extremely inexpensive for us, almost we can't lose. And part of that sometimes, even from a labor perspective in, in my industry is making it small enough so that we are sure that we have enough demand to keep to labor efficient. When we start looking at uh, hours of the day that we are paying people to be there, and labor for me is a huge percentage of, of, of our business, um, it's deadly, particularly when you're looking at very little funds, maybe, maybe a, a, a burn rate that's sort of gonna, gonna extinguish your cash in, in a short amount of time. You look at being as effective as possible. So every second someone is working, they're hopefully producing something that has a demand for it as opposed to uh, the maybe more traditional line of thought, particularly in a retail setting, which would be, hey, let's sort of establish the product offering to the customer from the beginning so that they can really understand it and say, hey, I know this place is sort of open every night or this place is open 24 hours a day or whatever the case may be. And uh, I don't think that's wrong. It just hasn't been my experience. My experience has been I have a very finite amount of cash and I need need to make the decisions that are most prudent to preserve that and hopefully be open in one week, one month, one year. And so that that scaling of the, the product offering from a time perspective, I think is a result of that largely. Does that make sense? Yeah. So with that being said, how do you decide when to do more things, when to make the investments? What, like, what is the trigger in you? And obviously it's gonna be different from other people, but to open on a Wednesday instead of just Thursday, Friday or something, or be open for more hours, open another restaurant. What, how do you know that you're in a healthier position to make those next steps? That cash flow looks better than just your bank account. Yes. So from a, from a, it's, it's, I think it's entirely demand related or, or our perception of the demand, at least it's easier to conceptualize for a location that exists already. And we can see that number one, uh, demand may not be outpacing supply, but we're looking at the 
our profitability, our cash flow sort of on, on each day. And if we say, you know, we're, we're able at a minimum, we can, we're, we're, we have revenue of five or $600 and we have costs of, and this is going to sound terrible, but we have costs of, you know, 90% of that. That looks pretty good. Let's maybe add another day. Also understanding that we're now starting to defray or, or, or distribute our fixed costs over a, a larger amount of time, just so at least it makes us feel better about the way our numbers look. Because at the end of the day, it's really not any different. But um, so that kind of on, a, on, a, on adding a specific day uh, is how we look at it. As far as adding another location or concept or idea, man, that is a really tough one. We have a, a, a an endless supply, I'm sure, like many of you, of sort of thoughts and ideas that we, we think are great. Hopefully some of them are, maybe they're not. It's I think opening another spot for me is a lot more about um, having the cash to mostly affordably or respons responsibly do it. Um, we don't always have enough cash sort of in the bank to uh, be responsible about opening another location, but we do sort of depend on cash flow. We, we so, we, so how do you handle that? So we operate extremely that. high risk businesses in an extremely high risk manner is probably the shortest way so, I can say it. So, so this has come up on, on the show. I'm posting this link. How do you involve your family in that situation? So whether it's someone that you're married to, significant other people that depend on you, you tell them a lot, do you not tell them anything. What's the situation like there from like cash flow to relationship management? It's a very good question. So, uh, and it has certainly come up in, in my marriage. Uh, my wife, uh, so I went through a period when, when I first knew her of really insulating her and that worked well for a while until she was kind of like, Hey, where's this connection here? You're not even really telling me what's going on. Um, which can maybe be more significant than you think. And, uh, so I started telling her more and sort of panic ensued and, and, um, a couple, and, and then, you know, you show up with the, you show up with a couple things and it's like, Hey, uh, so I just need you to sign this. And they're like, yeah, I trust you, but also what, you know, this is another lease or this, you know, and, um, so I think over time I have, or, or I should say we have, uh, become, she, she has become more trusting and I have become better at letting her think, she, let her, letting her know things she wants to know. Really, uh, you know, everything is sort of open for us, but, um, she just doesn't really want to know all of it. Some of it is just very stressful. It's sort of like, you know, when, when you have tax payments and payroll coming up on the same day and your account is getting hit by $75,000 and you're like, this is, you know, it's like, it's taxing to look at, especially in the context of thinking, how are we moving forward? Where do we want to move? Do we want to start another space? You know, some of those things are stressful. And I think, um, or do I need, I'm still in the startup phase with this business. And now again, I'm transferring money back over to this business. I really didn't want to be, I thought I could kind of continue. I thought by this time, I thought by four months in, we would be sort of more self-sufficient, but we've, con we've made choices, let's say that have required us to continue to transfer cash. And so, um, from wanting to be out of the startup phase as soon as possible to having huge hits of cash. I think some of those things are in my relationship, just not important, but I think thinking about it is important. So when you talk about cash transfers and so like that, not, not everything about your business, you don't have to answer this at all, but like how involved is your banker in the situation? So if you need cash to do something, do you have extended lines? Did you start with lines of credit? Do you do anything like that? Like how, so it really depends on your industry largely and sort of your bankability but uh my banker is not involved at all my uh restaurants are awful places to invest um that's why friends and family are traditionally the sources of um investment cash flow i think uh so my banker is is actually uh i, I do have a fairly close relationship and i've had other companies too where, where we've been much more involved um, work with more capital intensive sort of short cycle businesses but um in this particular set of businesses not involved at all we did not start with a, a, a line of cash um cashed in two thousand dollars in board stock uh but but uh yeah so so i think it's 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 highly uh 
depends on how bankable your industry is. But I think a, a banking relationship is important, especially if, uh, you know, you want somebody nice to call you when they're like, hey, uh, you had an overdraft last night? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I got another question. Yeah. Um, say we're all cash flow positive, right? Business is going good. What's your rule of thumb on reinvesting? Because it'd be nice to just increase your personal salary, but that's not um, that's not very dutiful of you and ignoring your business. So what do you, out of your positive cash, what do you reinvest, like typically? We, we so from a personal standpoint, we invest 99%. I mean, I would say probably even over that. Um, our salaries have not increased ever. We, and and I, it's, it's almost uh, laughable. So uh, we invest, we reinvest pretty much everything. Almost you know, 99 mm -hmm. cents on the dollar we reinvest. Um, whether that's sort of letting cash sit there and accrue to make a larger investment or whether it's continual investments in people, which is where we've invested a lot lately into sort of salaries or, or part-time people outsourcing. Um, we're, we're our, so from a cash flow perspective, we're, we are intent on creating a, um, a system that is supportive of a much larger volume of revenue. And so in order to do that, we're sort of sacrificing mostly everything uh, at the moment in order to create that system and try and tweak it, make it perfect, get all the right sort of people in the right seats and. So that's, that's my answer. Is that wise? I'm not so sure. I mean, I think probably, I, I, I definitely know people who say they want to keep sort of a burn rate of at least six months or so in their uh, bank account, which is probably wise. Um, also, I think for most people, unless you have a really good idea and have some pretty significant um, reserves, that's going to probably talk you out of starting most any business that you can find. If you, if you want to have six months of, of burn rate without having any money coming in, you're probably going to talk yourself out of starting a business pretty quick, is my thought. So, so with that in mind, then you must you must have a good handle around valuation of, of your companies then, because if you're just putting everything back in, you really need to know what you're what are you building, because valuation is what you're working for. So as far as like, uh, do you mean present value or sort of value moving forward or sort of? Yeah, future value. So an intrinsic I mean, value. You're not out now. You want to be you want to be building something that that has value in the future, or that just has a uh, a revenue stream in the future, or what is your what's your uh, so what you I guess for? when when for, for me personally, when I think of the word value, I think of sort of wealth building to some extent, um, and and it, it is important <clears throat> to us to, to create something. We, we're more interested maybe in the real estate around what we're doing to create that wealth from the from the uh, operations of the business yeah. specifically is yes, increasing the number and the effectiveness of those those revenue streams, that cash flow, and that's sort of what we're looking at. We're saying, hey, let's build this uh, system that can really take on more very effectively. And, and and truthfully, also, I'm always trying to work myself out of work. I mean, so so how can I continue to um, pay people for what I was doing or create systems that can can sort of handle and adapt to what I was doing so that I can go do other things. I can go maybe create these revenue streams that don't currently exist or whether it's just expand, expanding a brand geographically or creating a brand new um, identity. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we think about that a lot with, with my businesses too, in terms of revenue stream versus the value. And, and, and you know, you're in a different industry, so it's, is it most Revenue stream heavy is, is, is that, is that yes, because the that? value really of for, for me in, in a restaurant in, in most all restaurants is almost nothing. It's sort of like you know I have a, a, a construction company, and then the value is basically in the salvage of the equipment. There, there's there's very little value in these sorts of businesses. There's very you know we don't have a list of clients that is desirable to almost anyone. Salvage value is really the value of a restaurant as well. At the end of the day, now you may be able to find you you may be bankable um, by looking at sort of a percentage of your profit or your um or your revenue but but at the end of the day really if you're looking for uh, so i guess it's it's also depends on what your ultimate goal is if you're looking to become acquired which i've never done i've never started a business with that idea or intent or i don't think it would, has ever really been a reality for me then then maybe it's a, it's a very different 
sort of dynamic. For me, it's it's all about cash flow. I just want to say um, a comment. It's very important that people understand the importance of cash flow, it's particularly a cash flow statement. You go to the bank and you want to get a finance, uh, a loan being extended to you. That is the number one thing they're going to look at is your cash flow statements in terms of how much money do you have already going against your revenue on a period basis, which is each month, and how much that you're asking for. And then they're going to look at that and say, okay, now how much more can you take on as a burden to pay? So I just want to say that the cash flow statement, the cash flow is very important in, in the entrepreneur world and in, in business. Business. Right. So I guess a good point. So you can uh, go out of business with a profitable company that has cash flow problems. It's kind of kind of what you're saying. It's sort of your ability to meet the, the demands that are placed on you each month. Um, it's uh, so yes. I, I mean, I think that's a that's a great point. So, did you, did you say in theory you're building these restaurants not for the restaurants, but to build the clout up for the surrounding area so that your real estate investments can be higher, and that's really your end goal? Um, or did I mishear that? No, I mean that that, that that certainly could. What's that? You don't own the building. No. Uh, we have options on a couple, but uh, we, I, I, if we did, it would be even a more solid strategy, right? But, yeah, but, um, but <laughs> no, we, uh, but, but, yeah. I mean, right. So, so we are hyper focused right now on cash flow. The wealth building piece is going to come in in the in not through the the sale of the businesses. I guess it would be a more um, appropriate approach. We. The, the wealth that we plan to create will be through real estate. But so taking the money that you've earned from those restaurants and investing that in real estate. Yes. Okay. Ex executing those options that you have on those. Stations. Potentially, they're yeah. not the strongest things in the world, but they do exist. Makes you feel better a little bit. So I, I hear a lot of cash flow value, um, the the work of money coming into your business versus what you're spending out. Um, but I think the restaurant industry is probably a really good example, but it's starting to uh, seep more into the tech communities. Um, when you have, when you start a restaurant from day one, you're probably going to have competitors, right? All right. So how does you having competitors affect how you um, strategize and build your overall model for your business? Because I know your your model has to kind of feed into how you're going to get your cash and how that's going to come into your business. How, how are you getting people to your doors? How are you building your model so that you know, you'll be cash flow positive? So if you're looking at sort of a predictive budgeting or some sort of a pro forma in general, it's the best place to make yourself look like a millionaire than the next year of anywhere. I'm sure anyone who's played around in Excel a little bit knows that very quickly. And so, and so I think it's a, it's a good point from a cash flow standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the amount for, from a restaurant perspective, how many people are coming to the door and how much money are they spending is sort of on the revenue side, what's, what's important. And um, I, so I think the, the question revolves mostly around competition. And really, we, our competition, so the best approach is, we don't see any competition in the product that we're providing zero locally the reason is not because there are not other people providing things to, to consume as food the reason is because nobody has paired that with the experience yet and so we see everybody else at, who, who is providing food which would be the most sort of linear direct comparison um, as people who are helping us we see them more more as collaborative more as interesting we really aren't uh, when we hear of new places opening we're only excited there's not we don't we don't have a, and maybe this is unique to what we're doing or maybe our industry i'm not sure but but we are uh i don't look and say hey how much of, of the current business that's out there can we sort of divert and take and create turn into revenue for ourselves we look at it and say how many people can we um show something new to 
that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I actually noticed because I go to your restaurants a lot, um, and I noticed like when you when people talk about your restaurants, uh, they talk about first the name and then the food. They never like try to categorize you into, oh, this is Southern or this is New American or this is Chinese or they say, hey, I'm going to Handsome Biscuit to get X Y Z or I'm going to Hill Guy to get X, Y, Z, and they never kind of put you in a box. It just seems like they're always going for the unique experience. And I mean, I tell my people, my friends all the time, it's like, I've never been to this place, Hands of Biscuit, on the weekend, and the line's not down the street. Right. And immediately they're like, we gotta go. I haven't even told them what you sell or anything. They're like, they gotta go, I gotta go. Cause right, I think that's a, that's a that's sort of a good a good point. So one of the, the things we use when we're sitting around a table, having a few beers that we, we ask ourselves about uh, either spots that we have that exist or maybe new ideas that are that are on the table. We say, how would how will people tell their friends about it? That's we use that sort of phrase all the time. How will people, because that's really at the end of the day, what gets expressed. That's the, that's the most effective thing we think in getting expressed. So um, and, and we literally walk through some of those things. Hey, what do you think some of them say? We try to step back and have a more objective sort of point of view and say, when somebody walks through these doors, what are they going to, what are they going to experience and how is that going to relate to what they tell their friends? Because, um, I don't know, I think it's a really sort of insightful thing to ask yourself about what you're doing. I got it. Sorry. Well, I was just going to, I was going to comment on that. Um, I also see people saying things like, I really want a biscuit, you know, and I don't think anybody said that before you guys were in town. So I think that's a real, I mean, you've got people saying that, that that's, a, that's huge. And, um, and going to a place where people will never go. Right. right. Or, 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 that's or, an even bigger thing. Yeah, or, or on a Sunday morning. Nah, we didn't have too many. A lot of people. We didn't have too many options in North Carolina. Right. Right. So you've pulled, you've pulled people out and gotten them to spend money at a time when they're not spending money. And I think that's, that's a great thing that the breweries have done. Too, yeah, they pull all these people out of the woodwork. Now they're spending money, you know, at four in the afternoon or at noon on a Saturday. That's very true. I, done, I drive by breweries frequently, and I think to myself, "Wow, they're doing something right." So yeah, I don't know how to do that. It's a new coffee shop. Have you seen your knights do what you thought they would do at Handsome Biscuit? Yeah, no. They stay, they've steadily been on a increase that an increase an incline in revenue that looks nothing like exponential. <laughs> it looks much more like if you stand back far enough, it looks like a very flat line. Did you have to get an ABC license when you opened? We did not. We didn't have an ABC license for a long time. We added one, uh, thinking that it would add to, again, the overall experience. Not that it would become a driver of revenue, but that it would add to the experience. And really, I think we haven't done a great job of um, uh, sort of promoting the canned beer that we have. Uh, but. It just, I think, is also not as appropriate for the experience that we have. Simple question, or maybe I missed it earlier. Um, how frequently do you measure your cash flow, and is it always positive, or is there some like cyclical peaks and valleys? Yeah, peaks and valleys. Uh, with with so so, there is definitely a seasonality of really our, our cost remains. In, we have to sort of messing things up from a from a, a labor point of view a few times which have affected cash flow but our, our our costs remain fairly our fixed costs remain fairly static and our variable costs so the costs that are associated with producing whatever product we're producing those stay fairly consistent from a, from a percentage standpoint however we do experience seasonality we're actually coming close to the end of a three-month period kind of between um, Fourth of July and kind of maybe the middle of September-ish, where we have the lowest sales across all restaurants, just in general, for whatever reason. I don't know, kids. but I mean, we guess all the time. But um, kids. yeah, kids is <clears throat> definitely part of it. So, so we have we experience a seasonality in demand. We experience it intraday um, in, in all sorts of different ways. But um, we are so handsome. Biscuit is always profitable. Has always been profitable. Um, field guide has gone through uh, menu changes, personnel changes, has been uh, on, a, on a year over basis been profitable, but has certainly had months that are not profitable. Um, Toast has always been profitable. It's still very much sort of in a building phase. And then 
the deer dandelions is just way too new to it's it's actually it is actually currently profitable and sort of fairly static we're getting ready to add another day there because it's it's um pretty easy to manage and, and fairly static so uh in general everything we haven't had any uh we definitely haven't had any crises um there's been months where we you know you sort of start to to second guess right it's you, you have to really sort of look deep and think to yourself, hey, are we committed to sticking with what we're doing currently? Can we make small tweaks? Do we need to make big changes? As you watch, you know, as you as as your your burn rate starts to be more and more important, i.e. you're actually using cash and you are burning cash, you, you really start to get um, to, to look inward and, and question. And it's it's a challenging thing to know when to make a change or pivot or stick to your guns. How do you define profitability? Um, because day one, you said, so it means you put in $100 into the company. Day one, you made $101? Yes. Yep. So it's it literally more cash comes in the door than goes out. But, but not not in day one. Right over a period of time. Right. So your question was a period of time. Yeah. I don't know. If you put $50 in and make 50 biscuits and you sell them all at $2 a pound, you're making, you're making 100% profit. A like handsome biscuit at was day one. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's what I was asking originally. Do you measure it daily, weekly, monthly? Um, good question. Now, what do we do? Uh, <clears throat> month, monthly. monthly is 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 it as from a cash flow standpoint it is as uh, granular as we get. We do get more granulars from a sales perspective. So we look at sales specifically, not in relation to um, expenses, but we look at we look at sales more frequently. What about your strategy on price each uh, consumer spends and ways to get more bang for them in the door? What have you done to try to increase that? Increase that because it's really just extra dollars um, of profit. Right. So there's two sort of levers we can pull. One is getting each person to spend more money, and the other is having whatever dollars they're spending be more profitable for us. Um, We've done things for both. We actually just had this past week, and I wonder if anybody noticed it, but the first price increases ever at Hanson Biscuit. Um, so that would be very clearly one of those types of things. And there were 25 to 50 cents and not even on all items, maybe half the items. So fairly, I would say, um, fairly small. Uh, so that's that's one. Did you see a lot of people complain about it? You see, yeah, I haven't heard anything from anybody, anywhere, nothing. Right. social no people i think it's probably fairly hard to notice um unless you really have a, a, a an addiction right thing. um so so that's one way we do think so the alcohol if we're, if we're talking again about hands biscuit was a way that we thought to sort of add to what we in the industry call it a check average or the, the amount each customer or each table or however you look at it spends um it's it's made some effect we've looked we've we've seriously considered and really just not had the time in, in developing more uh, sort of retail items, um, things like bottling hot sauce. We just did our first run of t-shirts. Yeah, so sort of at some add-on type things. Um, what about your process of employees of teaching them those things? Do you guys have them go through kind of a playbook of, hey, when they're ordering this, trying to upsell cheese or bacon or, or get soda or? Yeah, there's a little bit of that, probably not as much as there should be. There definitely is. It's, it's easier to control, again, at Hanson Biscuit, where you have one point person where it's counter service. Um, I'd really like to move to counter service everywhere, both from a consumer standpoint and, and from a business owner standpoint. But I think front of house serves in, in the way that um, our entertainment model, as it orients around food, is really changing and being devalued. But but anyhow, I uh, so it's harder as that as that sort of uh, front gets larger. It's it's more challenging. We do have um, we don't do things that that a lot of restaurants do, like uh, trying to push things that we're moving out of the kitchen. We really push things more from a special standpoint. And specials for us are not like, hey, this stuff is going to um, go bad soon. We got to try and move it. It's more we bring ingredients in normally for specials that, that we don't normally carry. Or it's, we really look at it more as a as a, an experience enhancer, as opposed to a sort of a, a profit driver. Um, you're speaking a lot about uh, reports. Mm -hmm. When you say cash flow, you're talking looking at the matrix, the matrix, the period. You, you're speaking about reports. Now, how important do you feel 
is having a accounting system in place that will allow you to pull that data and at demand. How important do you feel that is to you? I think it's very important. I definitely thought to myself more than once and wondered how in the world people ever did this with true sort of like paper spreadsheets. I mean, it just seems insurmountable. But I think it's very important. So we've made sort of iterative steps over time to get better and better at this. And and I guess that advent looked something like uh, we started out using QuickBooks Online. We've st stuck with them. They're you know don't an accountant's going to tell you don't don't do it. They hate it, but it's sort of still an evolving product. Uh, it works well for us because multiple people use it from different locations throughout the course of a week. We're not transferring files or you know sort of doing all that craziness. We're we're much more we're we're much more nimble from a real estate standpoint as far as office goes. So um, use QuickBooks QuickBooks Online. You'll find very quickly that. Uh, depending on the, again, seasonality of your business. So for ours specifically, weekends are intense from a revenue standpoint and a cost standpoint, but there's a lot more activity going on. So what happens when you have a month, if you're running traditional reports and you, in QuickBooks, there's this great thing about, well, you can just run a P&L for January. Well, what if January had five Fridays? Well, already from a, from a, from a revenue standpoint, we have increased traffic from a cost perspective, we run uh, bi-weekly payroll. So we may have, depending on how it falls, we may have three um, payroll periods in there. So in a, in a business, in, in each business, I think is, is this sensitive on some degree, but in a business where you run 30 to 35% um, labor and 30, 30, 30 to 35% food, depending on, you know, there's all sorts of permutations, but all of a sudden you're looking at a, profitability statistically nationwide of fine dining, which we are not of 2%, and you're looking at um, sort of closely held restaurants at seven to 8% and more chain type things achieving 10 to maybe 12%, a tiny little fluctuation from the reporting standpoint can, can mean all the difference in having, a, having making an informed decision and not. So what we do in, in the restaurants or what, what we do uh, is we convert to uh, a a four week accounting period. So it evens out. We end up having 13 periods throughout the year. It, it ends up with a little bit of gymnastics from the in, in QuickBooks, particularly on, on larger expenses like rent, because we'll attribute 12 13ths of each rent paid to that particular four week accounting period, record the, the payment then. And then at the end of the year, at that 13th period, when we would have no rent to pay, we now have one 13th that we've sort of put into a prepaid account and we can now attribute it to that thing. So what it allows us to do is look and make much more informed decisions. So reporting is only as good as the sort of the base data you put in there. Now, I will say that all doing all that is certainly time consuming. And we've just about a month ago hired, uh, we, we, we have somebody, I've had somebody for quite a while that helps pay the bills and, and do things like that. But we hired a, a, a CPA who was helping us really refine a lot of that um, base data in there that can be mined out and turned into actionable. <coughs> items. What are your favorite business tools, not necessarily to do with accounting or cash or anything like that? Like what are what are the five tools that you're using daily to help nobody business? Caffeine, alcohol, <laughs> um, <laughs> the five tools. Those, those two are fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't the, those just happened to be mentioned first. So, um, <laughs> five tools. I think um quick books. Yeah. Okay. So actual physical tools, I would say um, QuickBooks is definitely a big one. Um, we use a scheduling software that is a pretty big one. It's called Shift Planning. We, it's been working very well for us. I also have a, a, a clean company that where, is where I started using it and it works well. We may transition at some point, but that works well. We use Slack. Has anybody heard of Slack? Yeah, I use it all that. Awesome. Super, super good. Um, From your internal or like your management? Uh, internal, so with all sorts of, we use channels as opposed to teams for anyone who's sort of familiar with it. Uh, and we, uh, it, it works really well. It's sort of supplemented text messages and group text messages that can very quickly get sort of out of control, be hard to search and um, not sort of, you can't go and sort of look at specific items at once. It's just sort of all in the chronologically filling up your phone. So. Slack, Trello, we use Trello a ton. Um, that's much more, we use it, I guess people use it in all different sorts of ways, but we use it in a very project 
oriented type way, whether it's a physical project or sort of an intellectual project. Trello, I don't know how many that is, but that's probably, oh, and then, and then Drive. We use Google, we, we really, so we started using Dropbox, and I think Dropbox is a good product, but, um, and, and really maybe it's just preference, but we use Google Drive a lot. I mean, heavily, heavily, heavily. What is, what is Trello? Trello is a, a, a really sort of a free form organizational app and, and website that allows you to create different boards, which are sort of subjects, lists within those boards, and then um, cards underneath. So, so you become, there's so three levels of granularity that you can look at, and then you can move move items between lists. I don't know, it's, I'm not the best Trello salesman, but I think just it's free, so check it out. Is it like an ERP or something like that? Say again? Is it like ERP, like a CRM? I don't know. Oh, I'm like a CRM. It's an agile rundown. You list out all the tasks, and then you bring them to one column to the next, and indicate that it changed some sort of state, like open to close or something. Right, so we can, I can get, so a quick example would be that I think is maybe on the Trello's, like, um, uh, ideas to do, to do doing and done and you sort of you move these things across you can vote on cards within an organization you can do it. it's it's, it's fairly powerful and really malleable it's very just slack uh, well too. what's that it integrates with slack. it does and slack integrates with um uh, google calendar to use having a good task list for from an individual standpoint not an organizational standpoint is really crucial i use one called no task is what it's called now but uh did you go to business school not no i didn't did you go to school no I do, though, go find college classes at, I don't know, universities that I think sound cool, and I find the textbooks in order to buy those and read them. Okay. I have a question about uh, cash flow in. Yeah. I um, basically had a sizable uh, IRA, so when I left my job a year ago, I was uh, basically pulling from, from the IRA, and uh, I still do on occasion. But I have a web development company that, that also brings in income. So, because my, my startup is not making money, and uh, I'm still working on it, sure. but uh, I'm, 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 I'm toying around with the idea of going back to work for yeah. somebody else, because marketing for my web development company, it takes up a lot of time to generate the income, and it doesn't leave any time for this, but if I had a full-time job where I didn't have to worry about that, I'd have a lot more free in time and energy to work on my startup. So... What would you what would you do would you continue doing your own thing or would you because you said keep your day job as long as possible and yeah uh, um i would say you know you probably know the answer to this deep down inside better than anybody me included and mm -hmm. to, to make sure i understand correctly i would say so you you have a startup that's not making money and you have a job that you could go back to but the marketing piece of your startup is what takes a lot of time well, I have two companies. Okay. I have a, a development company that's making money, but gotcha. it, it takes a lot of time to do all the marketing to, gotcha. make, to make that money. Okay. And then I have my startup, which I don't have time to do the marketing and stuff I need to do because I'm busy making money to pay the bills. Right. Whereas if I went to a full time job, it would free up my weekends and my nights to focus Does that on mean the dropping one of your other two ideas to go back to? Yeah. So yeah. I would say drop one of them. Drop one on Shelf it. I mean, you cannot look at it as dropping it. I mean, I don't know. Again, I think you know best, better than I do. I don't know the details, but I would say it's probably the best idea to, if you want one of them to succeed, make sure it succeeds. Right. Because that was the other children. thing you said. If you had one thing and one's not making and this one's doing it all, then there's a problem. And I, I, I see the problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, I just have to decide which one. Yeah, it's a tough decision for yeah. sure, but I would think you, you probably know best. I would say. If you think about it as like killing one of them, it's probably a little harder. Just say shelving. Right. You can always go back. Mm -hmm. hey, yeah. Feeding off of that, my question was going to be, what made you decide to go after multiple ideas? At what stage did you get where you said, okay, now I can go with a separate idea? Because I've heard, a, I mean, I've heard a lot of content saying that Mark, I mean, obviously you want to market, penetrate a market, and go after it and saturate it fully. And a lot of people have said you need to do the same thing with your ideas. Um, or the business you want to succeed in. What stage did you hit where you decided that wasn't enough? Man, I, a stage where I couldn't control my ideas anymore probably is the, the, the blunt answer. But um, so when I trend, so 
within restaurants, let's leave it there. I mean, I have other companies that I've sort of, I, I, my passion now is restaurants and I've sort of sidelined or sort of tried to autopilot my other companies. I, um, so within restaurants, as I transition or kind of start a new idea, I think it's really, um, it's, it's a very opportunistic thing that, that, that drives me to make the decision. So it's my current cash flow or, or amount of cash we have, an, a physical opportunity, a, a, a gap in the market that we see, um, something we're just really excited about. I think that answers it. Yeah. I was going to ask, uh, when you opened Hampton, you I thought you did some really smart things in, around fixed costs. What and I know, and I think I know a little bit of you know about your other businesses before then. So what what advice would you give somebody who's just starting out who maybe is opening up you know a theater store and they want all the best stuff in there, but you you know, I, I, sure. I mean, it's kind of it's got to be a you know I, how much use. Yeah, I very specifically I would say if you think about it like this. Somebody has your idea, more than likely, and is in the process of, or if not has already, executed it cheaper than you are and been successful. That's, that's likely true. Obviously not always true, but it's likely true, right? Somebody has figured out how to open up a beer shop just because, you know, they found some storage. I don't know. We could, we could sort of <coughs> guess this all day long, but somebody has done it. So push yourself to figure out what is really important, what, what is going to be valued by the end user. And then even what's more powerful is figure out how you can do something less expensive that will be valued more. So shift the sort of paradigm, shift the, the perspective of because I'm going to spend less, it means that I have to have a product that is less desirable, that has less value to my customers. I think that's, people get hung up on that a lot. They're sort of following something that they've seen or, or, or an idea that they have, or frankly, something that's trying to sell you whether it's a website or a person or whatever that's saying like you know really if we really if we have this system that weighs our growlers or, or our kegs before we fill them i know it's really expensive but man that's just going to make things so awesome who values that at the end of the day i mean so it's not that it's not cool it's maybe not a good idea and maybe it's a tenant of your business but 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 at the end of the day, think about how to do it less expensive and provide more value. And again, I think there probably is somebody out there who is doing it less expensive. Have you ever worked for corporate America? No. I did not do that. Uh, I moved to New York City out of high school and hung around there for a few years, raced cars, which is kind of uh, just a lot of fun. Moved back here to get involved in real estate, did very well learned a lesson in diversification and lost about $650,000 in a week and um, to started a construction company out of that with the idea of getting into development and kind of ran with that, got um, really addicted to sort of high performance building from both a uh, building science standpoint, but also from a design perspective. Then I continued to run with that, saw a gap in the market, which was, I was living downtown at the time and there was no our cleaning for, for the common spaces in our building was abominable. And I said, I can do a better job. So I hired two people and we now service about a thousand units in downtown in Ghent. And then fast forward, um, got, I worked in restaurants a couple places throughout that back in New York City and, and um, met my, so my wife, her brother owned the boot. And then we kind of got talking and next thing you know, started a restaurant and I found more personal satisfaction there. So it continued to head that way. So I don't know by, I don't know how I avoided school, but. How do you stay motivated when bad things happen or to not go back to that rat race or to ever start that rat race? Uh, I, well, I, I don't know that I'm a good litmus for that because I don't have that perspective, but I think, uh, or that, or that experience, but how do I stay motivated? There is no other option for me. That, that's a great way to be motivated, right? I don't have a degree. I don't, I mean, Who's going to value me beyond me? I can't go get a job probably for any of you because I'm probably not qualified, honestly. So, I mean, I don't have another option. It's it's uh, but that and that and sort of a perpetual uh, um, sort of air of positivity. I mean, just I, th I think that's important. I would hire you. And also, <laughs> caffeine and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> that's right.
Any other questions? This is great. You have thanks for listening to me. Quotes. Man, I love Park Place. Um, it's the confluence of opportunity and a built fabric that is appropriate for innovation. I know that's maybe not very specific, but. Good, man. How are you?